Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, thank you for uh, coming back from break promptly. Um, so, uh, you'll see on your tables a rather lovely leaflet from Ringgold, so please do pay attention to that. They're one of our excellent sponsors, so thank you, Ringgold. Um, one other small announcement. Somebody has lost a Samsung mobile phone. Um, so, if you, find, if you find you're missing a mobile phone, it looks a bit like this. Um, uh, it's down at the, uh, the event management desk next to the snow room. So if you find that you don't have a phone, that's where it is right now. Good. Okay. So we're now going to move on to the next session, which is uh, about uh, reproducibility and reusability. So two really interesting presentations, I hope, for you coming up now. Uh, once again, I'm not going to read out the bios of the speakers, um, but you can look at those in your packs. But I'd just like to welcome the first speaker, Katrina Fennell, to the stage. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks a lot. Uh, just to briefly introduce myself um, and also declare my conflicts of interests or bias, however you want to put it. So first of all, I work for Elsevier and the other thing I should probably mention is I come originally from a life sciences background and particularly on reproducibility. I think people, the people's background and their fields can very much influence their view and I know it does mine. Um, so just want to declare that. Um, I'm responsible at Elsevier for um, research integrity and reproducibility within our journals, so basically uh, policies and, and projects. That's sort of my, the context that I'm coming from. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, you know, the mounting evidence of there being a, a crisis in, in reproducibility and the concerns that um, you know, one of the seminal papers from John Ioannidis about you know, why most published research findings are false, which you know, it was hugely influential paper, and then more evidence coming from many different fields, from cancer biology. Some of it initially was sort of interesting, like Bayer and Amgen, for example, reporting, you know, that they were really failing to reproduce very key papers in cancer biology, um, often with the cooperation of the original authors. And then they were, interestingly, at the beginning at least, I think later they did publish some of it, but at the beginning they were also like not naming the papers, keeping the, the results confidential because that was the basis on which they negotiated with the authors, that the authors would cooperate and help them with you know, the methods and so on, but in exchange they would not publicize the results, which is interesting in itself. But still, um, this, more and more studies have emerged you know, in, in many different fields. Um, and you know, you'll have seen many times the, the nature survey where um, more, more than 50% of researchers agreed there was a significant crisis, 38% thought there was a, a slight crisis. Um, I always find that a bit strange in my house if it's a slight crisis. It's not really a crisis, but you know, I have two small children, so all things are relative. But um, the other paper that I find really interesting in this area from a few years ago, our well, opinion piece by Daniela Finelli, who's I think now at, here at LSE, um, and he wrote an interesting piece, particularly, I think, looking at it from the area of psychology and sort of questioning, questioning the sort of scale of the crisis in a very interesting way that I think is an interesting kind of counterpoint to some of this, which is to sort of say, well, yes, there are these issues, but how serious are they all? And, you know, is it also a healthy thing for us to, is it healthy for sort of people's belief and trust in science to be talking about this crisis? Um, is it a good thing for us to believe there's a crisis? Because if we believe in a crisis, then we're galvanized to act. So it's a positive thing. So very interesting perspective as well. But it clearly has um, had a huge impact on people's perception. I think maybe particularly within the scientific community itself, where for some people, I think also it has been um, quite shocking at times to, to face up to some of these things. Um, and I think the other factor is the variation between fields, which is very serious. And um, I sometimes feel when I talk to people in different fields, um, so for example, I talk to um, uh, computer scientists and economists where some of the issues that are coming up now, for example, in psychology, they feel like in that community, some of them, well, we already solved this years ago, or you know, pre-registration comes up as a topic. And in medicine, they're like, oh, we've been pre-registering clinical trials for, for ages, we solved that, and, and so on. So what you sometimes can see is this sort of almost cultural disconnect between fields, um, where, you know, um, if, and that will happen today, some of the things, areas I talk about, 
um, will be something that will work really well in life sciences and is completely irrelevant for, say, computer science. And that comes up a lot. And that's one of the things that I found interesting, particularly that um, drew my attention about the reproducibility manifesto, which I have a very bad habit of calling it the Manafu manifesto just because it sounds nice, but of course there are several other authors. And what I really like about this particularly is that it's a collaboration between fields. So um, you see you know, people from medicine, from psychology, from, from life sciences, um, and it's an attempt to try and look at, what they attempt to look at in the paper is really the underlying drivers, the underlying problems, and what can be done, what can be addressed by the whole community, you know, by journals, by funders, by, by, um, by institutes, um, to look at these fundamental issues that are affecting, in principle, all fields. And how you solve it, of course, can be different per field, but what they're really looking at is the common ground. And for me, that's very interesting because um, trying to solve these issues really discipline by discipline, journal by journal, in the end, you have to do that, of course. But if you can find some common themes and some common initiatives, of course, it really helps to move things forward in a faster way. Um, and of course, we all see, you know, um, manifestos coming up very regularly and some of them become massively influential um, you know for example in in ethics the Singapore statement from one of the first uh, WCRI conferences has been reused and reused for, for for a decade and then other manifestos you leave the conference and you never hear about it again you know um, and it's very hard to say you know on the day or at the time which ones will be influential but this was one that at least um, I found incredibly useful and just to explain like some of the, the reasons for that. Um, so when I say that they looked at the underlying drivers, they sort of broke it into sort of recurring themes. And um, each of these themes is a huge topic. So I really apologize. There is no way I can do justice to these themes in, in 25 minutes, not possible. But they're huge themes, but they're core themes like methods, issues with methods, um, uh, transparency about reporting, um, open science practices, they're called reproducibility, problems with peer review, you know, what was peer review designed for in the first place? And, you know, unfortunately, originally peer review was not designed to spot fraud. It was not designed to um, check for reproducibility, um, in most fields at least. Um, and now, of course, we're trying to reinvent peer review to be able to do these things that it was never, you know, originally designed for, which is a constantly moving, moving process. Um, and then they actually mention last, but I think sometimes I think this might be the most important theme in the end, is the incentives. And this comes up over and over, of course, right? Um, if you want to change a whole culture and a whole way of working on a large scale, on a global scale with millions of researchers, is it going to work without incentives? And what incentives will work? And, and you might see here some of the examples they give are really interesting because um, you'll see some of them are examples of things that have been, for example, badges. Badges have been pretty successful in computer science, um, and the ACM have been using badges. Um, the OSF have badges for like open materials, open, open data, and so on. And you can see that you know the communities tend to be very. Like, they like their own badges, but nobody wants to use anybody else's badges. You know, and of course, anyone who's ever tried to standardize anything across thousands of journals or different fields would be familiar with this, right? That everyone has a solution that's perfect for their own field. Um, similar with registered reports. Um, the first time I heard Chris Chambers describe registered reports um, in 2013, I think it was, I thought like, wow, this is amazing. You know, this is just so clever. This has solved so many issues. And, and he has been evangelistic about it. You know, he has spread it to 200 journals now, been super successful. But what we see is it does tend to cluster around the areas of sort of psychology, social science. And when we talk to editors in other areas, they find it completely sort of strange for their culture. They find it very hard to get their heads around how it would work in their culture. So some of these examples are things that can be field specific. Some of them are examples. So for example, um, declaring conflict of interest, that has been normal in medicine for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Now we're finding that we really have to sort of extend this everywhere. We really almost have to make this the best practice everywhere because there could be a conflict in any field. And if you're on, you know, very impactful topics like, you know, climate change um, and the use of, you know, um, of internet and so on and that affect government policies, someone declaring conflict of interest on those, in those areas could have more impact in the end than, for example, in a medical paper. So it's becoming more and more important.
So from the perspective of someone like me who's trying to look for themes and ways that journals across all fields can try to tackle um, reproducibility, this manifesto with these very clear kind of recurring themes that are common, but also looking at like very nice examples, I found this really powerful. And when this was published at the beginning of 2017, um, I basically used it as a sort of an inventory to sort of check, okay, where are we, you know, in Elsevier journals, what are we doing? Um, and in many cases, I would see, okay, we're piloting open badges in a few journals, or we're, um, you know, we're doing well on pre-registration of clinical trials, but we haven't done much yet on, on something else. And I found it just a really useful um, sort of sanity check. Um, and just to summarize, like, these are sort of the challenges, and it's, you know, this was a very impactful paper, as you can see, I'm sure we have many experts today on how to measure the impact of the, the, the influence of the paper, but, you know, it's not the only one, the nature, the famous nature survey on reproducibility. Also, researchers themselves came up with these very similar themes, right? So these are the topics that, you know, um, we need to try and address, and we sort of need to almost address them in every field. So the incentives, the incentives question. So this is a very interesting question, like how do you, how do you give, make it worthwhile for the author in a world where, for better or for worse, they're being measured in certain ways, and then you may be asking them to take time away from the traditional measures to spend time on something like curating their data or something that maybe doesn't get them immediately a promotion or doesn't get them a job. Um, so some of the things you can do are look at, for example, um, offering new types of journals, new types of articles. And for example, with journals, what we tend to see is sort of mixed success, I would say. Like when we have launched journals with sort of dedicated to a different type of paper, so for example, negative results journal, um, we, we launched the journal at a conference, everybody was, everyone thought it was fantastic, everyone congratulated us, it was all wonderful. Um, and then the submissions didn't come, you know, and, and we, we promoted the journal and the editors um, worked really hard on the journal. But, you know, it was like the field of dreams problem, right? We built it, but apparently nobody came. Um, and that can, be, that can be really an issue with these type of things. Um, um, similar with replication studies, um, again, everyone knows that there's, you know, bias in the process. We need to get negative results out there. We need to get replication studies out there. And of course, you can put these on the pre on preprint servers and they will be out there. But is that an incentive? Are you, you know, is that perceived as something you will get credit for? Depends, of course. Depends who's, who's counting and who's looking. Um, so some of the things you can look at are, you know, um, making your method, you know, giving an incentive to have a very, very detailed method or having been innovative in methods and get, a, get an article for that. So get something that people sort of associate with credit. Um, a, a data article, so for example, you know, not just yes, you should share your data because it's good for everyone, it's better for, for science, but also if you share your data, we can, you can get an article from it, you can have a permanent sort of evidence of what you've done. Um, something that we were particularly interested in looking at was replication studies and the whole sort of mindset around replication studies because it's one of those things that sort of everyone knows is an issue that either um, they're done um, but they're sitting in a file somewhere they haven't been written up or you know in some cases they're not done at all so we, we did some interviews with researchers and it was really interesting because what we found was like even though everybody you know um, all the researchers we interviewed, they were all, you know, all knew, of course, all the positive reasons that replication studies should be done and should be published. But at the same time, when we said, okay, well, how are they done and who does them and when are they done? Then it often became very kind of practical and very much just a part of sort of their workflow, which was really interesting. So, you know, they weren't going for the good of science, I'm going to sit down and do a replication study today. But they were things like, you know, someone starting their PhD it's good practice that, you know, before they start really their own work, they first replicate sort of the core um, experiments in this area. Um, and not only is that good to make sure they have a solid grounding, but also it means, some of the researchers told us, it means that they basically make their mistakes on that research. So they learn the practical processes, they learn, you know, how to run an experiment, and they haven't done it on their own sort of new experiments. And they also talked about things like testing new variables, um, tra yeah, training we talked about. Um, um, and um, one of the, the things that came up was sort of the question of, 
is it worth it? And what we found was a bit surprising was in some cases people were saying, well, that, that practice that we used to have, where when you started your PhD, you did that. Yeah, we're not bothering to do that anymore because there's no time for it, there's no resources for it. And they were saying, you know, we're under pressure to publish a certain number of articles by the time we finish our PhD already. So there isn't time anymore for doing these replications and doing this, this kind of fact checking. We just have to move on. Um, there was also a clear perception about journals, that journals wouldn't rec welcome replication studies. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things I found interesting was there's quite a few people who said, Journals will not, I mean, this is very confusing with all the double knots and so on, but basically what they were saying is the journals will not want to publish something that contradicts established papers because it's controversial. They'll only want to publish something that confirms published, um, published papers. So I thought that was interesting. And a while later, I was talking to a group of editors. This is anecdotal. It was maybe 10 editors. And I asked them how they felt about replication studies and receiving replication studies. And what they said, which is like quite consistently, which I thought was quite interesting, was they said, well, you know, and they looked kind of embarrassed, like they knew they weren't supposed to say it, and, you know, I'm going to get in trouble because they say something. They said, uh, <laughs> um, well, honestly, if it confirms a study, that's kind of boring. I don't know if my readers really want to read that. It's kind of boring if it just, but if it contradicts a famous study, that would be, I really want that paper. That would be super interesting. So the editors were saying completely the opposite from, from the author's perception. But of course, it's also relatively easy for the editor, right? If you're the editor and you're in charge of the journal and you publish something contradictory, you can probably take it. You're probably quite established in your career. But if you're an early career researcher, and you publish this, you know, there could be quite some, you know, p potential flack for it. It's not so easy for an early career researcher to be the one who, who publicizes that a famous work can't be replicated. Um, <clears throat> so unfortunately, with our experience, we, we decided that, like, when we launch specialized journals, they're not that successful. And, you know, in a way, that kind of makes sense also. They're new journals. They don't have, you know... As much as we say this doesn't matter, it does for authors. If a journal doesn't have an impact factor yet, it's not in Web of Science yet, it's not in PubMed yet, it's not attractive to authors. So we thought, well, maybe we should do this with established journals, where then there's less of this kind of barrier. So with our established, you know, 10 of our established journals in different fields, we did a call for papers. We proactively invited authors to come and submit replication studies. And they were, you know, I, I'm not saying it was, you know, the top, top journals, but they were decent, decent normal journals. Um, and really, it was, again, the sort of field of dreams, uh, really, we got almost nothing. Um, there was one journal in economics where the editor was really passionate about it, and he really, like, went out and actually invited certain people where he thought they might be interested. And I think he, in the end, published four, four papers, and this was a call for papers that was open for a year, and most of the other journals got nothing. Or what a lot of people submitted, which was rather odd, was a lot of people sent replications of their own work, which was a bit, a bit strange. Um, so unfortunately, just there, there wasn't a big uptake. And, and when we had interviewed people, one of the things that we came across was that particularly early career researchers, they were concerned about their first couple papers being these papers. And one of them said something like, well, if that's my first paper, people will think that's all I'm capable of that I'm only capable of like, replicating other people's work, that I don't have my own ideas. And I think that's, that's very interesting to think about, like you know, these underlying sort of psychology that maybe um, goes even beyond incentives of like, it's even beyond, like it's not good enough that they would get a paper out of it. It's what kind of paper is it? What would it say about them? The other area that I think may be interesting in terms of um, giving credit or giving incentives to people whose contribution is really important for reproducibility. So you have roles in the workflow, for example, uh, statisticians, you know, commonly like a statistician who's working on a medical paper where they're working specifically on the statistics, people who really contribute to the methodology. And at the moment, those authors very often get kind of squished into that group. You know, they're sort of the middle authors. They're not the first author, they're not the last author. And credit is something which came, you know, very collaboratively from funders, from the Wellcome Trust, from Harvard, from, from publishers together as a way to try and give this more recognition for different types of contributions. And I think that may help a bit. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that because that's uh, <laughs> run out of time. Um, so the reproducibility manifesto, one of the things they talked about was validation and the problem of validation and whether or not 
whether or not peer review can really validate reproducibility. Now, it's kind of sad to say, but um, the first step is, like, can peer review try to detect fraud? And I, I really don't like to nearly talk about fraud and reproducibility together, because, of course, 99% of papers that can't be reproduced is completely honest. It's got nothing to do with, uh, with ethics. But unfortunately, there is the couple of percent. Um, and one of the areas that's becoming um, has been a challenge for years, I think, that institutes and journals have been looking for, is a way of detecting duplicated images and, um, and manipulated images. And what we've seen with people, journals getting better at detecting plagiarism and duplication is, for example, you know, the famous paper mills. Those papers, the text is not similar because they know that now people can detect, detect text similarity. It's the images, and if we had the capability to, at scale, really detect similar images, that would be able to catch a lot of these issues. And there's a lot of, you can see there's a lot of developments here happening in academia, there's also commercial tools that are emerging. And I think it's finally at the stage where these tools are getting to the point where we will be able to use them at scale, which is very interesting. I mentioned registered reports earlier, which um, the super interesting initiative, um, I shouldn't assume, I guess, that people are so familiar with it, but. Registered reports basically works on the principle that when you've designed your study, but before you've done it, you submit to the journal, um, and it's called a stage one um, report, and the journal then decides on that basis with peer review whether in principle they will accept the paper. So that affects, kind of achieves two things at once, and the first one is the journal isn't biased by the results. So they don't know the results. They're not biased by them, and they're committing. Whatever the results are, we will publish it later when, when you come back to us. And the second aspect is, it sort of keeps the authors honest. So you can't pretend that you, you know, went looking for something that actually you found by accident. Um, and this has been, this is Chris Chambers from, uh, he's um, the registered reports editor for a journal called Cortex. That was the first journal to launch in 2013. And there are now 2,000, sorry, 2,200 journals in all, all areas offering this, in all um, publishers. That is an incredible success in a fairly short time, because it is quite a different approach. It is quite new, and a, a huge amount of it is down to Chris and his like, personal passion, but also the Center of Open Science, who have really embraced it and facilitated helping journals um, to roll it out. What I would say is that nobody could have pushed this harder than Chris in, in, in Cortex, the journal he works on, and still the actual uptake from authors has been really low. Um, and that's something I think we need to be mindful of. You know, um, if something just seems so logical, so attractive, and yet the uptake isn't there, these cultural changes, I think they are going to take time. You know, and it's not something that's going to happen overnight. This has been six years. But we are starting to see the last year or two uh, more uptake. So I, I really hope as these things become better known, it will increase. Another approach which is sort of similar is called results mass review. And then you come along after you're, you have done, you have got your results, but you submit a version of the paper that doesn't have the results. So it's already been done, you have the results, and the reviewers and the editor, similar process, they decide based without seeing the results, and then eventually they see the results. Um, again, people love it, authors love it, editors love it, but for some reason the uptake at the moment is still quite low. This one started in around 2016, so you know, maybe it's still a bit early. But I think some of these innovations are ways in which we may be able to help address reproducibility through peer review. Um, I won't talk too much about um, AI because also um, this is being spoken about later, so I'll just skip over this because I should talk about, uh, sorry, about met methodology. And met methodology is something that it is so field specific. It's so field specific that if I do a talk about this, and I mention a project that works in life sciences, other fields are kind of like, oh, why are you bothering with this? It's completely irrelevant for us. Because, of course, the method is completely different per field. Um, and what we'll see in areas like um, bio in biochemistry, things like um, the correctness of antibodies, knowing exactly where your antibodies came from, how identifying your cell lines correctly, these things are really important, and there are ways in which we can help authors to make sure that we get this information for themselves in future or for other readers. But in other fields, for example, um, st statistical methods are really the core method. So in psychology, you know, understandably there's a massive focus on, you know, 
education around statistics, improving standards and statistics. And there are some signs that um, that technology will help with this. So, for example, stat check, um, you know, just some simple checks on stats, but very interesting. Um, one of our journals is piloting it, they find it really useful. And you might know, recognize Tilburg University is actually where a guy called Dietrich Stapel was based. He's the dean of psychology there, and he turned out to have basically faked all his data. And, um, and that department then later on basically decided to try and address, like, how could they improve science, how could they encourage open science, and that was one of the motivations for building this tool. And, and this is, I think this is really exciting, I mean, we have to always be aware, these tools are always, are for a long time, going to need some human judgment, but the potential of these tools to really make the process more efficient, and to just to do things that sometimes there are things that a tool can do really well, that just, on the human level, you might, like with image checking, the human eye might just never see it, or it would take you a huge amount of time. So Rebecca is going to talk about research data and has far more expertise than I do about it. So I'm going to um, mostly leave that to her. And is Mark going to start flashing a red light at me in a second? He is. Yeah, <laughs> that's another good reason to skip it. Um, but also, basically, I do think that um, w one small thing I want to say about it is because there's a lot of talk about sort of mandating data sharing, whether you should mandate it or not. And just one um, intervention, let's say, that we found was at some point we put this nice feature in our submission system, which it wasn't mandating data sharing, most journals weren't doing it, but it made it really easy to share your data. Um, and we found that that doubled the amount of data sharing. And you know, I think of it sometimes as you know, the Steve Jobs thing with, with Apple and with iTunes. I think of it as kind of making it really easy for people to do the thing they know is the right thing to do anyway. So make it easy for people and you know, that will work to a certain extent. You know. We'll see whether um, as journals start mandating data sharing, what the reaction is going to be. So just to recap a bit, and coming from the, the um, reproducibility manifesto, the, the core recurring themes tend to be, you know, the difficulty of doing this between fields, and how important incentives are, how important data sharing is, importance of methods, um, improving statistics, and also the, the potential for the peer review process to validate reproducibility. Thanks a lot. Hi, uh, my name's Rebecca Grant. I'm research data manager at Springer Nature. Um, I think having seen Katrina speak, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is quite complementary to that. So I'm focusing completely on research data sharing. Um, so I guess I don't need to go into too much detail about what reproducibility means. Um, I think this survey is the one that Katrina was referring to the same one. Um, so this idea of a reproducibility crisis in science and whether researchers themselves perceive that this is the case. Um, so we did also find in that same survey that 70% of uh, these researchers couldn't reproduce somebody else's work and 50% um, couldn't even reproduce their own work. Um, so then a, a slightly smaller study that was um, undertaken in Nature Genetics was looking at just 18 of those papers, and they found that uh, two could be fully reproduced, six partially reproduced, and 10 couldn't be reproduced at all. But one of the conclusions of that paper is that one of the main reasons for the failure was um, data not being available, um, and then also discrepancies around data annotation, how the data had been processed, um, description of how the data had been analyzed. So we um, see this idea of data sharing and transparency around data as being key to supporting reproducibility. Uh, there are also benefits to researchers. So Katrina mentioned this idea of incentives. Um, I guess the uh, most compelling ones often for authors are around citations and increased citations. Um, there is evidence that sharing your data openly as well as publishing a paper uh, can increase the publication output of your studies. Um, so if you share your data openly, um, more publications will arise from that data set than if you hadn't done. Um, we've also seen a number of studies around um, an increase in citations if you share your data. So it's not that you get a citation to your data set, although that can be the case. It's that the paper you published receives up to 50% more citations 
if the associated data are made open. It varies a bit by field. Um, yeah, on a later slide, I've got a reference to a more recent study that was really large scale. Um, it was about uh, half a million papers that were uh, incorporated into it, and it, it shows the same trend. So I think they concluded around a 25% citation um, benefit to you if you share your data. Um, so this is data from a series of reports. They're published annually by Springer Nature and also by Digital Science. Um, so we do know that this type of author behavior is increasing. So every year we ask the same question. Um, how often do you share your data? So you can see uh, the purple bar, which is frequently or sometimes, has slightly increased over the past few years. And the people saying that they rarely or never share has slightly decreased. So things are going in what we would think of as the right direction, um, but maybe not as quickly as we would prefer. Um, in another survey that we undertook, uh, we were asking specifically about what kind of challenges people face. So we know that people aren't necessarily doing it. Um, we are aware that they feel they aren't incentivized to share their data openly. Um, but we wanted to get into the specifics of what they find most difficult. So why, why are they not doing this? Um, so we did find that um, about 62% of the people we uh, spoke to had shared their data previously, but that could include sharing it publicly um, or sharing it privately, so more of a peer-to-peer -peer sharing. 36% um, only ever shared data privately, um, and only 2% only shared their data publicly. So that's really the proportion that we're trying to increase. We want more public data sharing, more accessible data. Um, so just digging into what that actually means, when people said they shared their data privately, they were talking about things like emailing it to a colleague at another institution, um, passing data around on a flash drive, um, nearly 40% used file sharing services, so something like um, the cloud to share their data sets. And then when it comes to public data sharing, actually more than half of people uh, were still uploading their data set as supplementary information with their journal article, and that's really something we're trying to get away from. Uh, nearly a third said they shared their data on a personal or lab website, and then only a quarter said that they chose an appropriate subject-specific data repository for their data set. And again, this is exactly the behavior we're trying to encourage um, and getting away from this idea of uploading a data set, creating a PDF from it, and having it accessible beside the article. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to draw your attention to um, standards that are starting to be developed around what good data sharing looks like. So when we say that we want fewer authors to, um, for example, put their data on a lab website, and we want more people to uh, put their data into a repository, um, the fair data principles really underpin a lot of the reasons why that is a better thing to do. So trying to articulate um, what good data sharing looks like. Um, this was published uh, in 2016, and it's really taken off. So I don't know um, to what extent people are already familiar. Um, but a lot of stakeholders like, um, for example, the European Commission's Horizon 2020 funding stream um, really put this idea of fair data at the core. Um, it, it, if you read through it uh, in the published paper, it is quite technical, but at a high level it means that the data should be findable, so that means findable on the web, um, with metadata accessible, so you can get to it uh, once you know it exists, interoperable, so you could um, put it with other similar data sets and use them together, and reusable, people understand how the data can be reused, for example, through uh, the application of a clear license. Um, as I said, there's uh, been um, really huge endorsement of the FAIR principles. Um, you can see there's a number of publishers there. I'm sure this has increased since I grabbed these for the slide. Um, also repositories, so places like the UK Data Archive, um, Altmetric, ORCID, uh, and this is just a, a small selection of the different organizations who support the FAIR principles. So you'll start to see it pop up in things like um, some of our journals. Uh, instructions for authors might mention, we expect your data to be FAIR, and I think that's going to start happening more and more. Uh, but unfortunately, when you ask uh, our authors, have they heard of these FAIR principles, the majority haven't. Um, so the same with data sharing, uh, we see the trends improve slightly. Um, so back in 2018, 60% said they'd never heard of them. Um, and then 25% had heard of them but didn't really know anything else about them. Um, only 15% felt that they were familiar. Um, and then uh, coming into 2019, 
uh, 6% decrease in the number of people who've just never heard of them. And again, I think this will change over time, but the pace of change has been relatively slow. Um, so what I really wanted to um, talk a bit more about is this idea of understanding what researchers and authors need. So how do you get to grips with what exactly is preventing this behavior from happening? Um, what more support do they require? Um, we've published a number of reports on white papers over the past few years uh, looking specifically at these areas. So these are all freely available on the web. Um, and I think in all cases, the data sets underpinning the surveys are also available. Um, so if you want to um, take a look at the data set, you could do. Um, so the first one is practical challenges. Um, this was asking about those challenges that authors face specifically in data sharing. Um, we also, as I said, we work with digital science to produce the state of open data every year, and that always includes a survey. Um, and then we also went back because um, in our initial practical challenges paper, we hadn't had a very high response rate from uh, Asia. So we went back to China and to Japan to do a bit of a better roundup um, from those two uh, regions. Uh, so they, th those final two are kind of complementary to the first one. So then what we did subsequently, having surveyed around 11,000 researchers across the globe, uh, we decided to bring all that data together in a report called Five Essential Factors for Data Sharing. So we were looking at what the data was telling us in terms of challenges, but also what we should do about that. So what can stakeholders do to support change based on what we've learned from speaking to our researchers? Um, so I'll briefly talk about all of them, but um, most specifically about policies, uh, which is actually the first one. So we'll skip that for now, move straight on to credit. And again, I don't think anyone is surprised by um, the results that we found. 58% um, of our, the researchers we surveyed believe they just don't get sufficient credit for sharing their data. We asked them what would encourage them, and the top response was citation. So. We knew that already. Um, then other things that come up that I think are quite interesting are things like the idea of co-authorship. So if somebody uses a data set you generated, you become an author on that paper, which actually I don't think happens very commonly. Some repositories do require that. Um, some people felt motivated just by being acknowledged. Um, and then you can see there's uh, kind of a long tail of different ideas of what uh, researchers would find motivating. I should also say um, the idea that you can use these uh, suggestions to address some of these challenges. It's not just a publisher initiative, so we know there are multiple stakeholders um, in terms of uh, open data sharing. So these aren't all things that just a publisher can do. Um, so one thing that we are doing, um, which I think uh, Katrina also briefly mentioned, is the idea of supporting data articles. Um, so th we have a number of journals at Springer Nature that publish this type of article. Um, the two kind of main ones are Scientific Data, which is a nature journal that only publishes data articles, and then BMC Research Notes, um, which publishes a shorter form data note type. And if you're not familiar with the data article, the intention is not to state a hypothesis, but just to describe the data set that you're sharing. Um, if you're publishing in scientific data, there's an expectation not only that you describe your data set, you make it available, but it must be in a repository, and it has to have an unrestricted license. So the most restricted license you can apply to it is that you get credit if somebody reuses it. Uh, moving on to funding, um, we found in our surveys that nearly a third of researchers don't know how they would meet the costs of data sharing. Um, very few funders at the moment explicitly make funding available for data management, so I spoke to a group of um, uh, researchers affiliated with a UK funder uh, just before Christmas, and none of them were aware that as part of their grant application process they could request money for data management. Um, so even when it happens, I don't think there's um, kind of uh, penetration with researchers that this is something they could do. Um, something else that came up is practical help. So um, you can see it's a bit hard to read on the slide, I guess. Uh, but we were asking the researchers uh, specifically what do you find so difficult about having to do this. Um, so they said they felt they didn't have time to do it, they just didn't know how they were supposed to organize their data properly, don't know what repository they should be using, don't feel like they understand copyright and licensing, again, feel like they don't know how they can cover the costs. And then there was, again, um, there was a, a, a good few... Uh, people who said, well, actually, it's about sensitivity. So if you work with human research participants, how do you share their data? 
Um, so there are a number of solutions to this. Something we've been uh, running since 2016 is a help desk. So at the point where an author is being asked to share data by their journal, um, we have a team there to assist them if they're not sure exactly what they should be doing. Um, but similarly, like, universities would often have a research uh, data support person who could provide similar advice. Uh, training and education, so 65% of the researchers felt that they weren't appropriately trained to do this. Uh, the topics that they were unsure about kind of map back to those challenges they said they faced, so uh, repositories, copyright, something else that comes up quite a bit is misuse of data. So if they do this, is somebody going to do something with their data that they won't like? Um, and then something else uh, that came up quite strongly was cultural attitudes. So just if it's not the norm in your discipline, then you are unlikely to do it. Uh, so just focusing in on policy, um, we asked, uh, again, um, in the State of Open Data report, what would be the circumstances that would mean that you would share your data? Um, and what came up, so again, you can see increased impact and visibility, so I think of that as being parallel to citation. Um, people are motivated by the public benefit, um, but you can see the three that are highlighted are those stakeholder requirements to do something. So if a journal or a publisher has a policy that you have to do it, if your institution, your university is telling you to do this, if your funder is telling you to do it, we know that that is quite motivating um, and often people won't do it otherwise. So you need someone to step in with a clear policy that's well communicated so that the researcher knows what's expected of them. Um, this is from the China report, um, so similarly we asked, well, why have you not shared your data that you generated? And the number one response there was, the journal didn't ask me to, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about our policies and what they do ask authors to do. Uh, so we've been rolling these out since 2016. Um, at the moment, um, it's a live project, so we add new journals all the time. But as of uh, the end of last year, we had about 1,600 journals that did have a data policy, so that's around 65%. Um, the intention with having four policy types is that there is one that is appropriate no matter what discipline your journal is publishing in. So our type one policy, um, it, it talks about data sharing, it encourages authors to do it, but there's no requirements around it. So um, th there's nothing that changes for that author except they've been informed that data sharing is something they might consider. Um, and then we go all the way up to our type four policy, which is the really strict one. Um, and in that journal, um, in those journals, there's a requirement that you share your data. It has to be in a repository. Your data goes through peer review, um, and you should be citing your data uh, in your reference list as well. Um, and there is a bit of um, kind of overlap between all these policies. So we always want to tell people, share your data in a repository, don't upload it as supplementary material. We always encourage authors to cite the data sets they use in the reference list. And also we, we have a little mention of that help desk that I talked about so that authors know where to go for help. Um, so just to break it down a bit further, um, so these are stats in terms of how many journals have which policy types. So you can see the 489 and the 8 um, are for the stricter policies, and that means that out of these journals that do have a policy, actually only 497 altogether require authors to do something. So they require the author to do something, they can't publish without doing something. And that requirement is mainly, except for the type 4, around including a statement of data availability. So the expectation is just that as an author, you state in your manuscript where the data can be found. And that's all we expect you to do. Um, so I'm sure you have probably come across these before, but it's quite a short statement. Um, and they can be completely tailored to that author, so there's no kind of template that you have to use. So you might say something like, the data sets I generated um, are available in this repository, and here's my persistent link to that data set. Um, so you tend to see them cluster around the same types. Um, so this is that paper I mentioned earlier, that it, it's mainly about the citation advantage of linking your publication to research data. Um, but they also did a bit of work around assessing the impact when you bring in a strong data policy. Um, so this is looking at papers from BMC journals um, from the time before they brought in a, a data sharing policy right up to 2018. So the black line in 2015 is that, uh, that group of journals bringing in a data sharing policy that required authors to uh, include a statement of data availability. So for the first time there was a requirement that authors told us how to find their data. 
Um, so the big dark blue bar that you see um, slowly decreased towards 2018, um, that's people who had just never done that. So there was no information about where the data could be found. Um, and then looking towards 2018, you can see over time, uh, we have more and more people putting their data into a repository, which is good, um, and fewer people who are saying, my data are, are available on request and I'll send them to you, or I've uploaded my data as supplementary material. So, you, I mean, maybe it's obvious, but there is a really strong impact of having a policy that, re that requires authors to do something, because we don't see this in all, at all in the journals that have those less strict policies. If you make it optional, uh, we find that authors just don't do it. Uh, something else that we're working on at Springer Nature um, at the Research Data Alliance is trying to align uh, these data policies. So anyone who's familiar might have noticed that different publishers uh, have different policies. So they, they tend to have more than one policy, so three or four or five, uh, but they're not exactly the same. So this work we're undertaking at RDA is looking at how we align those back together just to make things a bit more um, simple and clear for authors, no matter which journal they're publishing in. Uh, we actually just published a paper based on this work. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to replace the link because it was literally yesterday. But we have a preprint that I've linked to, um, and then it's also been published in the Data Science Journal. So it's kind of giving the background to uh, why we started this work, how we did it, and what the output was. I won't go into that. Um, so next steps in terms of what we're doing at Springer Nature. Um, we are really part of a big drive at the moment to move more journals over to a policy that actually has a requirement for authors to do something. So in this case, we're looking to move about 900 journals to that type three data policy where you have to include a data availability statement with your manuscript. That uh, should be completed by the end of 2020. Um, we're also looking at moving our policies back into that Research Data Alliance framework that I mentioned, so there's a bit of work to be done there. Um, we're also looking at how we can support more journals to require authors to share data in repositories. So that's what we would think of as a very strict policy. Um, and we want to make sure that journal editors feel confident that when they bring this in as a requirement that they can um, support their authors in doing so. And we're also participating in the STM Research Data Year. Um, so I'm just going to quickly talk about that. I have the contact information for the lead on that project, Joris van Rossum, at the bottom if you're interested. Um, so I don't know, you may have already seen STM um, launched uh, 2020 uh, year of research data. Um, they have three aims, so and they're providing as uh, much support as they can do. They really want to increase the number of publishers and journals that have a data policy. Um, in doing so, they're really focused on that idea of data availability statements, so not just that you say the data is on request, but also you have a link somewhere to that data in a repository, um, and also to encourage data set citation, so adding data sets to reference lists. Um, they've already held a couple of workshops. There's another one happening on Thursday, actually. And there's a couple of webinars ready um, to go already about. So where publishers have, have already been through this process um, and have already have policies in place, trying to um, use those learnings to support other publishers in um, taking up similar policies. Uh, they have a toolkit at stm-researchdata.org. They're also quite interested in benchmarking. So. Um, what proportion of, of a publisher's journals would we expect to have a data policy? How quickly should things change? Um, so yeah, if you are interested in learning more about that, um, please feel free to contact Yoris. So, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much both. I'd love to see presentations full of graphs and data. It's not a feature of my presentations, but I do like to uh, see people who do have it. Um, okay, so we're gonna take some questions from the audience, the microphone people are coming to you. If you have a question, just wave your hand and I'll point to you and then you'll get a microphone. Um, if you could just introduce who you are. Um, we'll start with Rick on the left here, if someone's, got a mic, if someone's coming for him. Um, say who you are and uh, if you'd like to stand up so the audience can see you ask the question, that would be even better. Oh, what a treat getting to see me. Um, I'm Rick Anderson from the University of Utah. I've got a question for Rebecca and I realize this may be a naive question and I'm just going to put it out there anyway. Given that data are not subject to copyright, why is it important that, uh, that shared data be accompanied by a reuse license? Um, I think, so I, I don't think that most authors or researchers would understand the copyright implications of publishing a data set. 
um, and I just think it's better to be clear. So usually repositories will prompt you to add a license and we want to empower researchers to pick what they find appropriate. We always encourage as open as possible. So ideally CC0, which is basically as though you don't have the copyright anymore. But I think there's still a lot of work to be done to change practice because I don't feel like authors understand copyright enough. Isn't there, though, a danger that an author might pick a restrictive license that, in fact, they don't have the right, uh, imposing restrictions that they don't have the right to impose on the data? Mm -hmm. So if I, if I put data out there and say, well, you can use this data, but you can't use it for commercial purposes, the data not being subject to copyright, I don't have the right to say that. And yet now there's a document that makes it appear that I, that I can. Isn't this something that can really backfire? Um, yeah, I could talk about this all day, so I'll try and not do that. <laughs> um, so firstly, uh, we make an effort, so where we provide repository infrastructure, we don't allow restrictive licenses and many repositories don't, but definitely authors are putting licenses on data that firstly they don't own, they don't have permission to put a license on, they don't own the copyright anyway, mm -hmm. if there was copyright in it they don't own it, their institution does. Um, and also uh, I, I teach a bit around licensing and repository usage for data and uh, what I try to communicate to researchers is that like what, what you're trying to do if you apply a license is to protect yourself if someone uses data in a way, like are you really going to sue someone if they use the data in a way that you had said they couldn't? Like where does that, where does that end up? What's the point of even trying to do this? Although certainly in my experience I wouldn't say, I think there's a bit of controversy around saying data, there's no copyright in data because there are database rights, for example. Um, like it's, I, I think it's still relevant and important that we're explicit about what you can and can't do. Educating researchers so they make the right choice is a bigger issue. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think you had a question, Toby. It's a smart move to sneakily raise your hand while the answers are going on, so I know that you might be up next. Uh, hi, uh, Toby Green, uh, Coherent Digital. Um, I used to work at the, uh, the OECD and we were a big uh, data publisher. Um, we made all our data sets citable in terms of actually having a downloadable citation probably about 12 years ago. And the number one challenge was that we couldn't get anybody to actually use the citation. What, in terms of, you know, you, you make the tools available, but culturally, people don't cite data. They cite articles or books, but they don't cite data. Have you got any suggestions as to how to change that culture so that scholars actually cite data in, when, they're, when they're writing stuff? Do you think that's one of the reasons why data journals are successful? Because people perceive it as an article and then citing it seems more natural. I, I agree with you, we've seen the same problem and similar to you, we for two or three years now have had these, in all our guide for authors, it explains exactly how to, you know, how to cite data and so on. It's, it's been there for, for years and yet we don't see a huge amount of it. And sometimes um, some people even suggest, and from the ethics perspective, I'm not sure how I feel about this, but it's an interesting idea that the author should cite their data set within their own article. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? We Ethically? encourage that. Yeah. yeah, you also encourage it. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Because it's, um, I think it's about transparency. So if you used uh, someone else's data set or you're referring to something from your own data set, we'd expect you to have it in the reference list. But again, like what we've, I, I've really found from working on the policy rollout is that if you have a requirement or a recommendation like that where there's no requirement and no checks, then authors tend not to do it. But where we have journals, there's a very small group of journals that have the type 4 policy where it's a requirement, obviously it happens. So I think it's, it's quite tangled up in that idea of um, like incentivization, so if they understood why they should do it, they would do it. Otherwise, you can make it a requirement. But I'm not sure we find what the middle ground is there. But it's clear from your research that that's an incentive that people resonate with, right? I'm not sure people feel as incentivized by having a citation to their data set. So it, it, does that impact on their career prog progression, for example? Do they care about having that on their CV? I'm not sure. We would, we would like it to have the same status as having an article cited, but I don't think that's the case yet. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from someone? Uh, yes, just on the left there. Thank you. Richard Bruce Lamte from, from Ghana. Just want to ask a question. Um, in a research, um, in an academic environment, um, whose responsibility is it to re manage research data? Is it the research office? Is it the librarian? Uh, is it the researcher? Who, whose responsibility is that? Thank you. 
Um, so I would say it is the responsibility of the individual, the lab, the PI, so the people working with the data. You can't have a research office come in and be like, don't worry, I'm just I'm going to manage this for you now. Like it's something that the uh, researcher is working with themselves on a daily ba basis, and I think we need to make sure that researchers know uh, where they're trying to get to with this. So what should you be doing all the way along as you back up your data, as you document your data, as you do your research? Like what's the end point you're trying to get to? If you want to share that data openly, it's too late really when you get to the end to be like, oh gosh, I don't remember exactly what my method was. I can't put this in a repository now. Um, but like you do find institutions often have quite a lot of uh, support for this type of work. So if you're not sure what you're doing. Um, also what I've seen a few times um, is a lab or a research group hiring someone whose job it is just to do data management. Um, it can sometimes happen towards the end of a project, so after the data are generated, they might um, step in to start preparing things for sharing. And Rebecca, do you see librarians um, increasing their, their um, knowledge and their sort of um, their role in, in providing expertise on data sharing. Is, yeah, that, is yeah. that sort of an emerging <laughs> role for librarians? Um, I wouldn't even say it's emerging. Like Librarians are doing an amazing job. So when I talk about um, their support in, in institutions, I'm really talking about librarians. It is librarian. I think so, which is a bit in conflict with my uh, PhD research. So I'm an archivist. And I'm like, no, this is a job archivists should be doing. But at the moment, librarians are really outpacing us. OK, another question um, right at the front here. Um, thank you both very much. It was really interesting and very complimentary talks. Um, I wanted to ask Catriona, I mean, you've given some really um, interesting solutions that, that Elsevier has, has responded to some of these reproducibility problems with, but um, I'm aware that they are, um, it basically requires a lot of investment and thought and research by a big organisation. Um, do you have any um, thoughts or, or um, suggestions for how smaller organisations can, can also sort of make some progress towards improving reproducibility? Yeah, it's interesting you should ask that because when we, when, um, three years ago when we were looking at the reproducibility manifesto, one of the things that I mapped in terms of like what, what we could scale, what would be difficult to scale, was how much investment, how much development it would take usually. Not so much because of the money, but because of the time, you know, getting on roadmaps. And, and quite a lot of these things don't take much technical development. It's more a process. Um, um, so, for example, credit, you can do fairly low tech, it doesn't take a whole lot of development, but you need to decide to do it, and then it requires change management of persuading, you know, seeing editors are willing to change the way they work and see if authors are ready for the change. So there's quite a few of the initiatives that are not that technical, and unfortunately, though, quite a few of them do take more work for the editor. Um, so, for example, registered reports, up to now, because there hasn't been so much uptake, we haven't built a proper technical solution for it. Um, but it but it does require editors to work a bit differently from normal and some editors just find that that sort of extra bandwidth is just so, I mean to be fair we're throwing changes at editors there's always you know a new thing coming and sometimes they say look this year just you know I need to, to focus on, on these changes and not have it yet another process coming along so quite a lot of them are not requiring so much investment I would say the I would say the, the area um, that anything around the processes especially if the editors are willing to do it, and it doesn't even have to be so much work for the editor, it can also just be willing to take on board sort of, for example, with, with data sharing. Um, I think I saw you present before when you were talking about how much time it takes if an editor really checks yeah. the data availability statement really carefully. Uh, what did you say was that? Uh, yeah, I think the average was 10 minutes for editorial checks and five minutes for copy edit. Yeah, so, there's, so that could be a lot of editor time, mm. but you could also start off, and that's sort of, I think, what you, did, you said, and we also sort of encourage editors, start with app policy. And even if the first policy you have is quite light in terms of you don't have an infrastructure for it, um, and you don't have time to check every statement, but you're at least facilitating and making it clear that you encourage data sharing, it will have some impact. Um, um, so I think a, a lot of it is also mindset, and like, quite often the innovations that I see being most successful, they started with an editor. They didn't start with technology or loads of investment. They started with one journal and an editor having a good idea. And then I come along and they come and do that for another 2,000 journals. And you know, thankfully, they usually say yes because you know, it's nice to see your idea spread. But it often starts with quite simple, quite simple things. 
Yeah, and I think um, in our experiences in the policy rollout, like it's one thing to say to an editor, like please spend an extra ten minutes reading this and checking that it's correct. But actually, the um, much more challenging part was the kind of technical solution. So making sure authors see the policy, that we we try to get them to agree um, as part of submission that they've complied with it, and then getting that into. 2000 submission systems was actually probably the hardest part yeah. um, so like the idea of it's easy to say like okay this policy makes something a requirement so from now on this is what will happen but actually enforcing that checking that it's happened making sure the author was aware those are the really challenging aspects I think okay thank you um, Anthony Anthony Watkinson cyber research um, I wanted to ask a question of, of the two people on the panel um, my understanding from another meeting, which I think I heard you, Rebecca, is that PLOS have actually mandated uh, policies on all their journals. Is that, if that is correct, is there anybody here from PLOS who can tell us what impact that had? I'm looking around for Neil in the room somewhere. There we are. There's one here? They did that quite a long time ago. They did that about four years ago already. I think they were, yeah, it was quite Yeah, early, right? it's, yeah. so basically, um, there's a, similar to the graph um, that Rebecca showed, we, so we don't mandate that people make the data available. We mandate that they have to have a data availability statement. Um, obviously, for journals like PLOS Medicine, it would be inappropriate to make people kind of make, make the data available, but you do have to say where they are. Um, there are, and it's also the case because PLOS One publishes across such a broad range of subjects that not every paper actually has accompanying data for which you need a data availability statement. Um, but what we have basically found is that since um, people were asked or kind of told they had to have one, um, the compliance rates just basically went up overnight. And I think the difference between the data um, <clears throat> that PLOS saw and, and the original BMC data where there was that period I think where it was optional okay. is that um, where it was optional it looks like the quality of the de deposition was very high whereas once it was mandated mm -hmm. then people did actually make the, da the, the statements available so they are there. What I thought was interesting at the time when PLOS announced the policy I'm not sure if it was intended, but at least how a lot of people interpreted it. And it was, was it five years ago? It was quite a long time ago now. That, um, that it was going to be um, mandatory to share your data. And I was really impressed. I thought, wow, this is so ahead of the rest of us. We're all going to have to scramble to catch up. This is so amazing, fantastic. And then there was quite a backlash, which I was really surprised by. But you were, I mean, being the first to do something can also be difficult, right? Some people, it was a bit surprising to the level of passion to which some people, that's what I find interesting with data sharing, is like some people are really passionately against it. You kind of think like, how can you be passionately against it? But it seems to almost touch people personally or, you yeah. know, it's like my data, there's a sense but of But I possession. think like editors are often passionately, well not often, but sometimes are passionately against it too. So the idea that they're now forcing authors to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. Editors often, when they have a choice, don't go for a strong data sharing policy. In fact, they almost never do. That's why such a large proportion of our journals, which um, are journals where we gave editors the choice, have a very um, liberal data sharing policy where basically there's no requirements on the author. I think for us a lot of it seems to have been people slightly misunderstanding what the requirements are yeah. and that's something that we, you know, I've certainly had conversations and I'm not primarily the person who would have those but um, where people aren't clear about exactly what they are required to do and that it's not that you have to supply all of the data but that they do have to be, you know, you do have to have an availability statement, it does have to be clear how somebody can access the data. Yeah. Um, if they want to, and I think that's part of what the issue has been. But it's great that as it becomes more um, commonly adopted, that I think people get more used to those requirements and how they can meet them. Yeah. But I think you definitely had an influence on that by making, you know, in such a large journal as well, like Plus One, it has a big influence. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that's probably it for questions because we need to move on. So um, uh, can you join me in thanking our two excellent speakers in this session? Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Okay, thank you. Um, just one quick announcement. I'd like to draw your attention to one of our new sponsors for this year, which is SKS, and they're on page 24 of our program. I can't believe the program is this big now. Um, uh, but I would commend you to reading their little uh, description of themselves. Um, Tib Tiberius is here somewhere. Are you in the room? I, don't, I can't see you. Ah, there he is. Um, over there. Um, so catch him if you can, talk to him about his business at lunchtime. He has to go uh, a little bit early today, so you won't get a chance to speak to him at the end. Um, so that's your big chance. Uh, so now I'm going to send you away to lunch uh, back here at 1.50 for the next session. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.